Hello, everybody. Welcome to Age of Quarantine Wednesday Night Edition with your host, me, Party Shepherd. Uh, I wanted to say uh, hi. I don't know. You're um, in for a treat tonight. Uh, I'm a little unprepared because I had a, such a busy day today getting ready for live stuff. Oh, Martin's here. This is Martin BC, producer extraordinaire. Hopefully this is going to work. That would be wonderful. Anyway, Martin is uh, a guy I met many years ago. Hello, Mr. Hey, BC. Hi. Hi. What's going on, buddy? I haven't, see, I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, yeah. I cut all my hair off. <laughs> uh, how you doing, man? I'm good. Yeah? Yeah, you know. You, you're in your, you're you're in your right. world famous... I... <laughs> a bit? Yeah. Tell me about it. Oh, hey, our, 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 our connection's a little weird. Have I been handling it? Uh, I mean, every, well, well, I'm okay. Tech, I'm having a hard time hearing you, but. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> so uh, I guess this quarantine year, I mean, it, it 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 was kind of heavy duty, you know. I kind of uh, I'm in an isolated part of Brooklyn, so it's just not weren't a lot of people around. It was interesting that it's comforting for it to feel a bit like the old days, uh, where it was just desolate in this part of Brooklyn and Gowanus. So that actually was strangely kind of nice. Like I really in my brain was connecting with another big experience of my life, which was a good fifteen twenty years being in this place since 1979 and it being kind of desolate. Yeah. So and, uh, let's, you know, uh, let's, like with a lot. Let's yeah, explain a little bit about that. So you are Martin BC and uh, you are the owner operator of BC studios, which has been there since 1979. It's on the corner of third and third, which is now famously right across the street from a new whole foods. Um, right. I am, I am currently on fifth Avenue and 17th street in the basement of my bar. <laughs> so we're we're right right down the block from each other. Um, oh, do, do you do you own Freddy's? No, I own South, which is the bar next to Freddy's. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. I I you know, I, whenever your name comes up, people are like I always say, "Oh man, that's so crazy, Martin BC." And I, I don't think a lot of people understand like what a incredible thing it is for you to first of all have found that space in 1979. When that, I mean, it was fucking desolate, like desolate. And I remember, I mean, even parking there in 1995, it was kind of like, you know, it was a little weird. But the, uh, so your your studio has been there for 35 years, which is just unheard of. And, and well, you know, it's actually, let me jump in because in January, it will be uh, 40. Oh my years. gosh. Wow. Yeah, because the first recording session, to be really specific, the first recording session was 1981. I moved into the space in 79. That's true. 81, it started, and it was actually called OAO. OAO right. o Studio. Operation All Out, right? That's right, which was taken from a clip from a William Burroughs book, I think it was right. Naked Lunch. And um, then stuff happened in the studio, but it's the same space. But yeah, 81, right. so really in two, 2021 will be 40 years. So just have to throw that in. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just, it's just unheard of to not have to, you know, lose your lease or did you, did you buy your space? Do you own it or you just pay rent? I just pay rent. I mean, I, I, the whole thing, when you said it's amazing that I, it just goes on and on a lot of dumb luck, really a lot of dumb luck. Um, sometimes when people say, Oh, you must be doing something really good or great. I mean, yes. If I'm doing something really good or great, that's fine, but that's not why I'm still here. I'm still here in this space because I'm not going to put it all on. It's because the music was so great. It might have been, but it's be just really dumb luck. So I, I for instance, uh, I, I picked it just because it was two floors, you know, because yeah. I thought, oh, we can rehearse and have our gear on one floor and live upstairs. Really the main reason. And uh, dumb luck near the canal. So the, so development was kind of, has been kind of hindered and the canal yeah. is polluted and a uh, now a super fun site, so it really it's getting cleaned up. So really toxic. The 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 most toxic stuff in the 
in North America, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, other, another piece of dumb luck is also I'm in the it, it's a building complex and I'm in the inside part, like I'm a little seat right. in the middle. So I'm sort of shielded from noise. I don't bother people as much. Dumb luck. And also right. dumb luck is that it was was bought by by a family and their sort of black sheep uh a child, kid or cousin or just family member, their black sheep person said, let me sort of manage this building and make it sort of like an art thing. I, I had no hand in that. It just was dumb luck that that's the guy. And it's still the guy. So he's still here. I mean, he wasn't the guy initially, but he moved in in 1989. He and I was, oh, he actually, his family owns the building. I didn't even catch that right away. And then right. he started trying to get artists in and he's got a whole arts mission. And I've found a way to fit into that. And well, I mean, yeah, uh, your studio is definitely uh, associated with the artsier side of rock music, um, alternative music. Um, so you, uh, what, uh, and to get into the space a little bit before we get into your discography, which is way too fucking long for me to, I mean, I tried to print it. I was like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this record and this record. I was like, this is fucking insane. It's like pages and pages long. <laughs> I've been doing this a long yeah, time. Yeah, it's a lot. It's <laughs> thousands. But uh, it, it was uh, what? Uh, so you know, in, in uh, transparency, I recorded an album with my band, Mind Over Matter, 1995, uh, called Auto Manipulation, and we basically went there because Diamond 16 had been there, and Diamond 16 was Gavin Van Black's band after Burn, and the album that you did with them was probably my favorite sounding record at that time. It was just was like. There's just a, there was an energy about it and we wanted that energy and just walking into your studio had such a vibe. It's such like a gritty, like, just like, fuck. Yeah, man. It was cool. And what you did as a producer for me personally, first of all, you were the first person that I ever worked with who had flying faders, which was awesome. <laughs> it was like, that was a cool experience, but also. Yeah. I really rely on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, and, it was perfect. That board sounds incredible. And what you, so to give people an idea of how it works, you have two floors and you have a basement, which is basically just all brick. And the band sets up spread out from each other and plays live. And you wouldn't let us use a click track, which, you know, which I was, you know, definitely fought against at the time, but you were right at the end of the day. But the way the drums sound in that room, the way that the, bass resonates the way that like a band can vibe with each other it's truly like no other live room i've ever recorded in and i really feel like it was a huge part as to why that record sort of became a legendary thing uh at least on long island and amongst a, a couple of germans here and there but like it, it's uh just that, that that whole vibe and then the, the most fun i think of that whole session was when we decided that we were going to sequence the record on two inch tape and and you just fucking went slicing away <laughs> and put like everything sliced up and we just handed the, t the 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 record as is and we're like this is it like you know you can't fuck with it you can't change the sequencing this is our record and it was like you were so supportive of that from beginning to end and i think we even recorded the songs in order and it was just a really great experience and you know i i, I would say that like I hope that other people have that experience as well. You know, like, like after recording with you, I could hear it. I could hear it in those Swans records. I could hear it in those Cop Shoot Cop records. You know, it's just that fucking gritty, like real deal situation. So let's, let's go back to when you started. Um, so you were working, you were, you were working as an engineer before you opened the studio, I'm guessing. Did you have your own studio in the city or were you just working in other places? Uh, no, I was def I was definitely not working as an engineer. I was really part of that material with uh, Bill Laswell, right? And um, I mean, it's f it's funny because being part of that collective at the time, and it it's really interesting because Laswell really had a vision of us being like like a collective, where like literally, like when you think about it, it's like people do completely vastly different jobs, but are still part of it, um, part of that collective. So the, so I actually. Um, was sort of a member of material, even though like for shows, I was like stage manager or, or there was also a now sort of legendary tour of material before they were called material that was with, um, went on 
on the road with David Allen's gong um, mm. and some Gagma playing piano. And, you know, it was very like psychedelic era uh, from Europe kind of stuff with Giorgio Gamelski, who was like someone that used to like manage the Yardbirds. I mean, it was an amazing experience. I was actually still in high school, but that was 1979. And that was the roadie. And I was still a member of this collective. Um, right. But that's how they, they want to see it. You know, so Wait, if you were, you were in high school how, happening. You were in high school. How did you meet? How did you meet Bill Laswell? How did you like get involved in all that? <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's actually, it's also dumb luck, man. Dumb luck. I was really in the right place at the right time. And that would be New York City. And I didn't, I didn't do anything. I mean, I just was born here. I was born in Manhattan. I didn't, I, I, I didn't make any hard choices. Like, okay, where am I going to go? And I got a bus too complacent and monochromatic and I didn't, none of that. I just was there in Manhattan. Right. And I went to high school in the Bronx. And it was just, the, you know, it's no genius on my part. It was the right place at the right time, as we know. I mean, in a way, when you think about it, my parents came here from Argentina. They chose New York. My mom was a pianist. And she, I guess, in the late 50s, thought that's the place to be. So she made that choice. And I just rolled with it, I guess. The thing is, is um, my one of my best pals was Michael Beinhorn. And because uh, I, I basically just knew all the I mean, I screwed around on drums, but I wouldn't even I, and maybe that helped me in the end. But I did not think of myself as a serious musician. I was like, well, I screw around on drums. And I um, I was in the theater class in high school. So I was like doing lights and stuff. And uh, all my friends were musicians just from mu musical tastes. But when I mean musicians, I mean like high school bands playing at dances and stuff. But anyway, so Michael Beinhorn, he was like he, he was my roommate. And then Fred Marr was one of our pals, although he was like you know, 14 at the time, all the people I just mentioned ended up going into production. So, uh, uh, Meinhorn produced like Super Unknown, um, mm -hmm. Soundgarden, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. And that was my roommate as a teenager. And then Michael yeah. Beinhorn, who, I'm sorry, um, Fred Marr, um, he was, uh, he ended up, I think, producing a Lou Reed record and he was, uh, uh played drums with Lou Reed. So we all, it's, we, Again, wow. just found each other and were this little cluster. And they answered, yeah. and they answered um, a Village Voice ad put in by Laswell, which I'm going to paraphrase. It's something like, just got here from Detroit, you know, looking to find like minded people, must like um, Stockhausen and Throbbing uh, Russell, maybe. I was, I was wondering, like I was wondering what that. influence, so what my, influences. So my two friends. It was interesting. Like I was going to ask you, what influences Bill Laswell would list? I, <laughs> That's crazy. He, he, well, I mean, he could have thrown in Stranglers, maybe, for instance. Right. Okay. And yeah. So, but but they, so my two my two pal, he might have. I'm I'm making it up, but I know that those were like the touchstones, right? Um, and uh, the, my two pals disappeared. I I was wondering what the hell happened to them. Like by, Michael Bynorn and Fred Moore, they were just like not around for like two weeks. I said, what happened? They go, we met this amazing guy, Bill Laswell. And he's staying at this place, Georgia. And we told him about you. We told him you're like in theater class and you're doing like st stage lighting and you thought it might be cool to maybe do sound or any of this stuff, right? And so Bill, because, you know, he was kind of smart. He was into like setting, to, setting something up and getting people that were young and enthusiastic and had the right energy, mm -hmm. got the big picture and had some skills to bring in. So he liked to meet. Okay, I like to meet. I'll, I'll meet him. And so I literally just went to meet Laswell at that building. And um, interestingly enough, in that in the lobby of that building on 24th Street in Manhattan, uh, there just happened in the middle of the afternoon to be a John Zorn rehearsal. And so it was, um, I walked in, literally opened the door to this large lobby area where they, uh, it was like 20 people. It was one of those John Zorn game pieces. Everyone just doing like freaky stuff, you know? And I, <laughs> at that time, my, my tastes were kind of prog. I was kind of prog. Like I liked, I liked yes, but I also liked the Sex Pistols, and I liked I, craft the, work. But you Martin, know, there was a lot. Martin, of Martin, I'm covered in yes tattoos. Come on. <laughs> oh yeah! Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, you can you get a better view. Of it, okay, but, well there you go. So, I, wow, I'm beautiful. Surprised so we that, never okay, talked so about it. Get, so I was. Oh yeah, <laughs> big time. No, and I love material. I love, so, um, I love all that shit. So, like when you mentioned Gong before, I'm like, nobody ever talks about Gong. I mean, Jesus, David Allen, total freak. But, but so, that, so, so re really, when you see, yeah, exactly, right. So, and that was also interestingly enough, total sidebar that that was 
a serious introduction to like major hippiedom, like major. That's how I saw it. I was like, oh my god, this is the shit you read about, like real full on hippie. But interestingly enough, sort of dovetailing with punk, there was this weird like hippies that were punk in in the East Village happening, and then there were punks. Yeah. So it was all very mixed mixed up. But anyway, well, the simple point I wanted to make is when I saw Zorn, it was weirdly enough not that much of a, a jump from from stuff like listening to Jeff Beck, listening to Yes. Or, like somehow it was complex. There was a lot of surprises. It was ambitious, and they and I realized and, and I was writing graffiti at the time, so it was a, I liked the mess and then so suddenly and the aggression and stuff. And this was like, oh my god! So that was that was the day. So I met Bill Laswell, saw John Zorn. I don't know if I talked to him, and then I was kind of sold. And I kind of um, within a few months, I started doing stage managing, and we went on that tour. Even though I was still in high school, I managed to sneak away for a month and and that was sort of the, and then at some point we decided hey we need a space in Gowanus and we weren't even talking about a recording studio it was just get a space in Gowanus and I thought and that was sort of my job because I had a little money uh, uh, truth be told uh, my parents both had died my dad had died that year like oh, in wow. 1978 so okay. yeah well that was also part of it I was a little bit of that, that hardcore kid thing where I, I needed like youth culture and stuff like kind of badly yeah, you know, as I as I say, as I've said often, five dollars all ages kind of saved my life. So I was, I was kind of there looking to do shit and you know metaphorically burn shit down, and um, uh, then yeah, so I just took it upon me and it wasn't even intended as a recording studio, and even the part with the whole the, the massive vaulted ceilings and the big brick walls and stone really all all that stuff I didn't even realize that that would be useful. It just happened to be there. So again, dumb, dumb freaking luck. And even the first record we did with Brian Eno didn't even use the downstairs. It was just like little stuff, like little mics and like recording stuff in like stones oh, and wow. boxes and, and like little so there, so, it, was so, like, it was like little sounds. It wasn't like- So well, no ISO booth, nothing. You just like, just like right out in the open, right? Is that like, it's no ISO booth, nothing. It's like right out in the open, like- well, with the with the Brian Eno thing, I mean, I wasn't even sure what the hell we were doing. I just was like, okay, he and and the fame famous thing is that he 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 helped us out. Like he was, I guess, and said, Laswell sold them. I I was I'm an asshole. I didn't do anything. He Laswell sold them. Said this guy Martin, and we got this space, and then we're, and then he just was like, this sounds interesting. And then he came and visited me in Gowanus, and um, he was imp he actually told me he was impressed basically that I treated him like a nobody. <laughs> and you know like taking him on the subway he was no one would have taken me on the subway and i'm like well i don't i'm a teenager i don't fucking take cabs you know at the time so um but yeah so i didn't even know what we were doing <laughs> so I had, like a tape and a little a little soundboard it's funny because i got the same soundboard that was at cbgb's like i got the same thing soundcraft board and, and i did sound there mm -hmm. occasionally and and actually laswell got someone to teach me at cbgb's because his girlfriend worked at cb so he got someone to like oh our friend martin he's like you know does you know, and, and then so I was like, yeah, sure, I'll learn. And so someone actually taught me on the, like, helped me do sound live at CDs. Did, so did I didn't you, know anything. So, so you're completely self-taught as an engineer, like, as far as, like, studio goes. So somebody taught you how to set up mics and work the board a little bit. But once you were in your space in Gowanus, you were sort of experimenting and, and figuring out how yeah, to record. I was, yeah, I was, I was very self-taught. I did do, like, two months, somewhere there in the summer. Um... And I think it's because of like my, my dad's lawyer or something. Like he was, what are you going to do with your life? Because, you know, um, uh, actually, I think, I mean, I was actually an orphan there for a minute. So I think there was somewhere in there some summer because my dad died when I was 17. So I think somewhere in there, I took the two classes at the Institute of Audio Research. over mm -hmm. still be there actually in Manhattan on University Place. So I took like a couple of uh and it was it was kind of actually kind of bad because they they figured you wouldn't possibly have a career as a recording engineer, so they taught you a lot of technical stuff like kind of no interest to me. So it, like electricity and stuff. I, I mean, I kind of remember that stuff. It's not it doesn't hurt to know. But so yeah, there was a little bit of training, but nothing beyond that. And so, yeah, and they so did you, talk a little bit about audio. So I did understand different kinds of mics very roughly. What, what I always found interesting about you as we, when we recorded with you, I like, you know, I'm, I'm very inquisitive, especially with people who are older than me and have had experiences with recording my heroes. Or your, your, um, your, 
one thing I didn't know about you when we went in was your graffiti artist history and your history with hip hop, early hip hop. And I found that like maybe it's an easy jump. I don't know. Like, what was the, was everything sort of mixed together at that time where it just didn't matter? You know, like there wasn't like a separated scene or there was, but everybody kind of dipped their feet in each other scenes. Like what was like, give me, give me New York City scene, yeah. early 80s. I remember you telling me stories about Madonna, like all sorts of fucking crazy shit. You're like, give me, a, give me a scene. Show, tell me, tell me what Seabees was like in like 1980, 81. You know, like how was, how was that? How were people interacting in that way musically? Uh, what's funny, because I, um, I actually did not experience experience some of like the big ticket stuff at CBGBs. Like someone said, oh, did you see television? I'm like, oh, fuck, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't see television. You know, I actually didn't see anything that I thought was really big. I'm still that way now. I'm not even interested. I like, it's not like I'm against big stuff. And it's, and it's not like there isn't some big stuff that people really talk about that I wouldn't mind seeing, you know? But it's funny, just my, my, my time and brain is very full with like a lot of like more grassroots stuff with people you know like I'm, I'm just full up with people you have know or just friends of friends let alone people that are in some other sphere so and and also age like so i guess the people in television were, were like older than me and stuff yeah um i mean the one thing that's the, the one thing is cbgb's did not bring in a lot of like the hip-hop scene where you really saw that sort of uptown meets downtown was kind of in the mud club so okay. that's where you found um you know, so I don't know if Africa Bambata really even went to CBGBs ever, but they would definitely also because there was a lot of spinning at CBG. At, I'm sorry, at Mud Club, it was like kind of this. That's where you really love of like punk. Like he would like at at, at which was somehow a little intimidating to me. Uh, at the Mud Club, uh, bear in mind I'm like 19 or 18 or something. Is like upstairs was where like Legs McNeil hung out at the mud club so i was like mm -hmm. so i mean that's bona fide punk right there so i was like go in i was like oh it's closed upstairs because legs is here it sort of felt a little like that and right. i don't know what the hell he was doing up there but it, it had so there was a little bit of a you know so hanging out with this crew maybe jane county or wayne county and these people or or uh maybe alan vega was upstairs or i don't know but there would be that so that would be happening upstairs very bona fide punk but it was very also kind of a DJ thing, like the DJ was really important. And actually, I, I remember a lot of mixing that was done here in the studio. We would check out how it sounded at the Mud Club. So we'd slip it to the DJ, get it played on the big system. It was actually very important oh, cool. that it sounded at, good at the Mud Club. It was also that there was no college radio. That's how people would hear stuff, right? The, the people, right. at least in that little rarefied grouping, it would be like, how do people hear stuff? And it would be, well, I guess we'll have to hear it at the Mud Club. But that's where there was that. Like, I don't really... At this point, remember being at CBGBs and really thinking about the DJ, although I'm sure there was a DJ. I just never thought about it. But that culture existed at the Mud Club. Um, so, like, that's really where I first heard. Well, actually, I, well, that's where I first heard, like, the initial Africa Bambata stuff that I was not involved with. They played that there. So you had, okay. you really had um, an intersection of, like, dance music and, um and hip hop and like socially punk and then also just weird stuff like there was like weird experimental but sort of like glammy experimental you know um it would be like experimental but who's that guy that played violin he played electric violin with a lot of effects but you know it was kind of like glammy he dressed kind of weird and oh, futuristic yeah so it wasn't like it wasn't like i can't remember his name yeah <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, it's just i knew i wasn't going to try to remember because i can't remember but really cool guy totally experimental you know, but, you know, or even like suicide seemed kind of experimental to me. Totally. Actually, I hate to say it, but hip hop in general, hip hop in general, I thought of as overlapping with experimental music where even though now you might not think of it that way. But at the time, it was like kind of anything goes sound wise. And when I worked with hip hop kids, they were like eager for like crazy ideas or weird stuff you know they had their stuff their beats and stuff but there was all kind of, first of all in their arrangements there was all kinds of room for stuff you know there's rooms for weird sounds you know and now when i listen to some of those things i recorded here here i'm like oh wow i remember it seems like in uncontroversial now but like now at the time like weird snare sounds with like feedback 
right. and just stuff like that. That seems like no big deal now, but at the time was took first of all took a lot of work and took gear and took uh, knowing how to use it. So all that kind of intersected. Also, another part of the the New York mix happened at Danceteria. So that's where you would have you know like hard bands like Rat at Red R and Swans, and then maybe you'd have like a and I remember seeing some flyers of Danceteria and looking at the, because the, the mix there was that they had three floors or even four floors at like this other little cabaret room. So you would actually see Fab Five Freddy, who was like a hip hop and arts person. And he would be, you know, maybe have an opening and then Rat at Rat R two floors down and Swans, you know, or, and, or DNA and the No Way yeah. Band. So that's where you really, that mix in New York of having the three floors. There was another venue Is called it? a, is Danceteria where Webster Hall is now? Or was it what, behind no. it? Was it behind no, it? No, Danceteria, no, no, because no, Webster Hall, that's like 14, uh, 13th or 11th or 12th Street. 12th Street, yeah. Yeah, okay. no, Danceteria was like in the 20s. Okay. It was like, right. yeah, it was in the upper 20s. And there was another place called Tier 3 that was in um, Tribeca. And that had three floors. The three floors thing was really working because you could have these vastly different things happening and people would check each other out so no, i mean it's, a, what, it's amazing it's amazing cbgb's it, cbgb's was a little more like kind of one thing or the other and i think laswell really and zorn because zorn loved cbgb's laswell and zorn would would push the owner hilly to like book different kinds of stuff so for instance um the uh the before the gong tour before that whole thing happened with david allen Laswell talked Hilly from CBGB's um, into letting letting us do the Gong show there with like all this all these variations. It would be Gong and Mother Gong. It was like a it was almost like a mini festival in like four <laughs> four hours. So he, he talked and Hilly was a little bit skeptical. He was like, I don't know. I mean, it was like massive hippie hippiness and and um, and he was like, okay, well you can no problem. You can you can just take audition night. The CBGB's have audition night Monday, Monday yeah. Night. Yeah. yeah. So, so he's, he's just, well, whatever, just take, take, you know, audition night. So, okay, fine. <laughs> we took audition night and I'd never seen anything like it. It was like, and first of all, like, sorry to keep referencing hippies, but what's funny is I thought that that stuff had disappeared. I didn't realize I looked over and it was like a line around the block, which is actually at that time was kind of rare for CB, for CBGBs, like around the block and then some of like just flower power you know, um, wow. psychedelic, mm. like full on hippies. And I was like, Oh my God, I'd never seen this before. And it was <laughs> crazy. And then it, it was so sold out. I mean, it was so sold out and it was hippies up to the rafters that we actually ended up doing the whole thing twice in a row. So we didn't get out of CBGB's till five in the morning. And oh my I God. Went straight to class. I went, I, I, I didn't even go home. I went, got on the, I said, fuck, I mean, you have my stuff, but I had a test, a math test. And I went straight up to the Bronx to go to class, but that was a uh, pretty massive enough. Very significant. There was one punk, at least. The legs was at that show. Oh, okay. Um, which was very, very weird. Maybe I shouldn't. Be. We we had a bit of an interaction. Maybe, he, maybe he was secretly a Gong fan. You know, that's a. That's I, he okay. did not really act like a Gong fan. <laughs> gong, Gong, got, for, even for the prog scene, Gong was pretty punk. So, you know what I mean? They're they're pretty fucking out there. I, I mean, that's the thing that I found out because then it's sort of, it's it sort of. They made, first of all, I just kind of realized that these things weren't that different. Even Legs has admitted, it might even be on the back, it might even be on the back of Please Kill Me. There was like sort of a, an admission that sort of, sorry for all the hippie hating, kind of, I think he said something like that. I don't know if he said sorry, yeah. but it was sort of like, they weren't that different from us. But there was definitely a sort of, um, um, uh, the narcissism of small differences, you know, was like, no, we're not like that. And this is like this. And, right. um, you know, I mean, I gotta say, Legs was heckling. He was heckling at the Gong Show, and um, <laughs> I, I, I had to ask him to stop, and that was not well received either. Oh my God, that but, sucks. Uh, <laughs> so, so let me, yeah, let me ask but anyway, you, I mean, yeah. Let me ask you, like the the, so going from there, it's just like I, I find like your trajectory to be very very interesting. So, you. Like, how did you start recording a bunch of like the No Wave bands? Like, how did that sort of trajectory because i mean most people don't know this i didn't know this before i started working with you uh you know 100 million years ago but like the the uh that you recorded herbie hancock's rocket and you have you had the gold record behind your couch i remember that 
<laughs> which is so funny. But um, uh, how did I, like, like, it's just, it's just everything you record was so diverse. Like, how, how do you go from, like, where, where did the no way thing, which you, you are very associated with um, in name as an engineer and producer, how, how did that all start? Who did you meet that sort of like you just parlayed or were you just given free, really cheap studio time to people or like, you know, how did it roll? Well, I was, well, I was giving really cheap studio time actually, but, um, and I guess this ties into that is there wasn't really that many options for recording. Again, some more dumb luck on, on my end. I mean, there wasn't uh, all the studios, there was no home recording. People recorded stuff with like two microphones. It was a bunch of that that would happen. And um, um, I think that the studios that were viable were kind of bigger than, you know, they were more like expensive for one thing and a little more legit, a little more connected to the industry. And, you know, and for one thing, I kind of started small. So when we talk about a recording studio, it's not like it is now. I had that soundboard that I just, got because it was the same one at CB's and that's why I picked it. And, and then there was like a reel to reel and, and I started very slow and didn't, and had, and had gear that I couldn't even combine with the other stuff because I didn't have all the connective tissue. It was, it was kind of a shit show, but um, so I started slow. Um, and, and I said, there wasn't that many options. So by word of mouth, people would come around, but it's kind of worth noting how much, because even if bands don't seem really, um, even directly, because there's often connective tissue with, with like side people, like side members, and like the band DNA, the No Wave band DNA. Um, the drummer, Ikaway Mori, was like a longtime friend, partner, I think a, a partner in very many different ways of John Zorn. So she was like John Zorn's like close pal, and um. And that's the drummer who we rarely talk about, really. But so she came from a full on avant garde uh, scene. And I started with Zorn way before I went kind of no wave. So so really, when it's fun, I, I got to admit that when we, when we say me and no wave, it was not 1977. It wasn't like the, the, the Brian, Eno record, no New York. It wasn't like I wasn't in I wasn't in on no wave in 1977 or 78 or 79. It really started happening after I started recording and I recorded some game pieces of John Zorn's. So that might've been the connection to Arto Lindsay of DNA. Okay. Cause then he came in with like, with like John Lurie from the lounge lizards. And even though I actually did not record DNA here, I recorded all, all the members kind of independently and in other projects. So that started coming in. And then everyone knew this guy, Mark Miller from the, who died unfortunately recently from the toy killers. He was a guy that was, Again, drummers get around, right? Like everyone knows the drummers. And this was a guy that would blow stiff up. Um, this was, he, he came from this school, which seemed very normal to me that, that live performances should be kind of dangerous. Like there was like that weird thing that sometimes, like now that we've been talking about safe spaces and stuff, and I'm all about safe space, but it was interesting. It was like, wow, shit was kind of dangerous. And I did not <laughs> make the, the leap in my brain like wow it shouldn't be dangerous like it just made sense well you of course you risk your life to come to a show that means <laughs> something like I, I, I mean i'm sorry I, i'm not even proud of that but it's just the reality I, I, and luckily no I, you know I, I i agree but like you know being a club owner now nowadays is like such a you know like when you say stuff like that someone blowing something up i mean i i you know like with the amount of insurance you deal with and bullshit and like you know it's like like there's so many things to worry about that like if somebody comes in and fucking blows something up, they're getting thrown out so fucking quick. And it's like, it's like, it's funny how you say like, you know, when I was a kid too, it was the same thing. It was like, it's like, yeah, the danger of it was what was exciting. It was cool. It's like, you know, it's like Keith Moon on crack. Look, the drummer's blowing shit up. But, you know, there's like in New York City has become so litigated, so fucking like, like beaten down with rules. I mean, especially now where live music is going to come back looking a lot different than it did before. And it's it's a it's just interesting for you to talk about that because it just made me miss it in a way. Like I was like, yeah, oh shit, that feeling. But in some ways, as you get older, you're like, I don't want to really risk getting hurt at a fucking show. You know, is this really? Well, yeah, open? I mean, th there was th there was stuff where there was I knew to not get anywhere near the stage. I mean, there was bands that would jump off the stage and start slashing people's clothes. Well, Swans, so Swans was, like, was kind of Swans was pretty dangerous early on, like. From what yeah, I, from and what I, I, I think I, I missed. 
I think I missed the very, very beginning of that, but it doesn't matter. I was, I was actually scared of swans. So, so before I actually met them, I would actually be near the back. I was like, this, this is some scary stuff. They were just scary personally. Like I, yeah. I was, I, I was scared. I was scared for my, for my, for my life, even physically, not around Jarbo, but like around like Algis, who's like <laughs> a sweetheart, right? But Algis kisses. I mean, I was just not used to that, you know? So I was like, so he, he scared me. I thought he'd fucking take me down or something. So, but, but first, didn't? so going back, <laughs> so going back, that guy from Toy Killers, the drummer, mm -hmm. and it's funny because even when I, so he came to me, the Toy, the Toy Killers, and even in some of the credits of records I did with him, it'll be like incendiaries. So he'll actually, he'll actually use that as an instrument credit, incendiaries, which is sort of a <laughs> lightweight as he's blowing stuff up. But, you know, you just add, like quarter sticks of dynamite. Um, I mean, there was stuff that I saw that I was like, oh, my God. Wow. Someone really almost got like some fucking projectile that flew past. I mean, hey, it wasn't that far later, that much later that we were into Mark Pauline and um, Survival Research Laboratory. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, that you, this is the first time you got me. <laughs> S SRL Survival Research Laboratory, Mark Pauline. There's a new documentary about these these shows in the desert in, Lo in the Los Angeles area. It's called Isolation uh, Isolation Center. I think it's Isolation Center. Uh, I, I forget, but they it was like very Einstein to Neubauten era where Mark Pauline would make these like robots that would have wars, right? And they would they would actually, the, the one time I saw, because it was, it's very West Coast. So the one time I saw it live and like everyone and their mother from No Wave and every, like everyone was there. It's incredible. It was in the parking lot of, of uh, Shea State of Desolate in Queens. And he, he has these robots and it would be a dystopian robots have run and now they're fighting each other. And it would be like artillery and like javelins and like air cannons and they'd shoot air cannons against like the walls of like Shea Stadium and stuff. So anyway, so that's some danger for you. And oh my God. That, well, that that's amazing. That, that's like so ahead of its time. That's crazy. Like, wow. Yeah, I, I don't know so, if you were but I remember Lydia was there lunch and, you know, Fetus was there. And so we were all like, I mean, at one point, whoever's controlling these robots points the fucking cannon at like the audience and we're like, I almost fucking fainted. I was like, oh damn, I'm, a, I'm, I'm chicken, right? I'm, I'm totally Dude. chicken shit. And I was like, oh my God. Anyway, but I'm just saying that that's the environment. So. Right, right, right. And I that got came, it. And that came like maybe 10 years afterward. Toy Killers, the guy from Toy Killers, he, I mean, drummer, I guess he just knew. It was just like a scene. They, they were more, all these people are kind of more social than me. So they would know, he, who knows, he, he still claims, but I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people suggested me to Sonic Youth, but he claims to, to have suggested me to Sonic Youth, but then he was also friends with all the like, so there's like a lot of infrastructure under like people that just kind of know a lot of people. So he happened to just know, right. um, and this is, Pussy's a terrific guy and blows stuff up. And then I guess the no way people like DNA would know him. So there's a lot of word, basically a lot of word of mouth in short, but right, right. Really of course, of course. On it for you. <laughs> and then it just, yeah. And then it just, then it just kind of feeds on itself after a while. I mean, it's so in the 80s. Yeah, also, I, I mean, also I'm really sorry, but the, but the, the Herbie Hancock rocket thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also a thing of like, of like people having different fortes. That was Laswell in terms of like hooking that up. That was, and also that's Laswell's M.O. Like he was very into finding these like faded, his whole thing was like the faded legend that needs kind of a makeover and needs to be more up to date. So that's why you have Herbie Hancock. And luckily I got to record it, um, bringing Ginger Baker into the studio. Right, right. Again, another sort of, a sort of, you know, a, a, a sort of, not has been, but, you know, a sort of slight, slightly, let's just say faded legend. Um, and even Motorhead, when, which had nothing to do with me, but when Laswell did that, that also at that time maybe needed a bit of a makeover because, you know, it was the '80s and the punk. Yeah, was no, I, I, just, I never, I never yeah. met Bill. I, I, uh, I worked for him. I worked for Material. I did some stuff when he was like shortly signed to Sony for a couple of minutes, um, and uh, like, yeah, that was the vibe that I got about him is that he was just this really charismatic guy who like just love music he wasn't concerned about selling records or being you know like he it was all about the music and where it went and, and you know back then you had the luxury of that well, i wanted to bring up a story about um a certain uh gigantic pop star who re you recorded the vocals for for a material record mariah carey if, uh, correct me if i'm wrong but that's uh did 
how did that all happen? Whitney Houston. Whitney, Whitney Houston. Houston. I knew it. Damn it. I was so hoping it was Mariah Carey just because I wanted her to be from <laughs> Long Island. But okay. Uh, so Whitney Houston. Whitney, how the fuck did that happen? I, I almost to say, oh, yeah, of course. Excuse, excuse me. I know, dude. I I'm, hear you. I'm looking at my notes. I'm like, what the fuck? Why did I write that? <laughs> Long Island, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Whitney Houston. Um, that was, I mean, that was all like back room. I mean, that is the thing, though, is Laswell did actually like, he liked the environment of, you know, these sort of mostly male, like mavericks, like back room. Maybe he didn't smoke a cigarette. It was a little bit of that. This sort of like, you know, he liked this sort of almost maybe the, sometimes even seeming kind of shady, like shady Mavericks music industry um, people. Like, you know, he, you know, he would do stuff with like um, Chris Blackwell of Island and stuff and, and sort of like be like, like a hard ass with him and saying, Oh, um, you know, you have to do this. If you want that, this kind of stuff. Like, oh man, you're playing hardball with, you know, and like going in and demanding a half million dollars in like a paper bag. Right. So this is the kind of stuff that that Laswell liked. And a lot of the people that he liked, a lot of a lot of his mentor, people that he admired in the industry, not musicians, all have been accused of like, like maybe financial impropriety having to do with artists and stuff. So it's all like a bit of a mess and kind of a little a bit gangster and stuff. Oh. Um, so there was stuff that happened. Like so, so to get Whitney on there was like like the, the guy from the label that put out um that put out that record was called One Down from Material. I guess it was Electra. It was Electra? Yeah. It's a major label. Like he knew uh, 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 um, Whitney Houston's mom, I guess Cicely Tyson. She was like mm -hmm. an old school, like heavy duty, kind of amazing soul performer, um, old school soul music. And her daughter, teenager, I think it was like four, 16, something, something like that, 16 year old Whitney Houston. Um, wanted to get her feet wet in something and hadn't really performed as a lead singer. So there was an opportunity in this band material to, and so like, so it was a favor. It was a favor. It was, excuse me. It was a, it was a favor to the, it was a favor to the, um, uh, the, the, the president of the label. So who knows? It was a little bit of like this business. And so then we got Whitney Houston. She had an attitude. She was like, my mom said I could do anything I want on this song. And uh, interesting, that song is in, is quite interesting. And this is like an, in, a great little piece of irony that Laswell stuck on there. It was pretty pretty brilliant. It was a, a song that was first performed by the Soft Machine. So it's it harkening oh, back to like right. to, yeah. to, 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 to psychedelic music of like London, right? Um, and it was like Robert Wyatt, I guess, who's from like Soft mm -hmm. Machine, I guess. He was a drummer. Bef yeah. bef before... Yeah, so it really comes from that. So it's like really the last thing you would associate um, with Whitney right. Houston. But then that came along and it was also was, again, like Laswell was branding himself. I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. I'm not this person, but Laswell has that. Right, no, no, no. And it's... He branded himself as like knowing the hip stuff. And it was kind of good. And I'm I, honestly, I'm kind of fine with it. And, and even when he, when me, even when me and Laswell split up, he would still come back to the studio every once in a while. Like he would bring, he would bring the Ramones to the studio just to do like odds and ends. So I did like odds and ends on like Brain Drain, the 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 Ramones record or Iggy Pop right. Instinct. So so Laz would just bring he would he wouldn't do the record with me or mix it, but he would just bring Iggy to do vocals for a month. So that's all fine. So I think that that's also part. It was weird because why would Bill just with these basically humongous budgets still want to come and just do a little odds and ends. But it was interesting. I think he also is a bit of an alchemist vibe. I think last week's got that feeling of like, yeah, yeah, that's stuff. cool. Yeah. So he would be uh, like, well, we want something. We just got to, all we got to do is just do a couple of things in BC studio. He gets, throws a little bit of that uh, smoke into it or something. Who, who knows how we thought. I didn't even ask him. I was like, get sure, magic. Yes. Yeah, I get it. I, 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 <laughs> that's cool. That's fucking cool. Well, so what's interesting is uh, I, I, I want to get into, one of my favorite artists um, in history uh, uh, is Swans and Michael Jira. And uh, I, um, that was another reason why we wanted to go to you is because you did uh, White Light in the Mouth of Infinity and, and Love of Life. 
uh, The Great Annihilator. Uh, I mean, these records are, to me at least, because of like uh, Love of Life and White Light were the first two records I had heard by them when I when I worked for them in the early 90s. And, uh, and I was like, just floored. I was floored. And then of course, I went back to Greed and Filth and realized that bands like Godflesh had kind of ripped them. And, you know, it was like, they, like, just how amazing an artist and, and you did The Growing Man as well. Or did, did you do that whole record? Or did you just do pieces of it? The Growing, the, the growing Man? It's, isn't it? It's The Glowing Man? Called? The Glowing Man. The Glowing Man. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was like it was it's a oh. more recent one. Uh, oh, how recent? Uh, two years? Past, like, two years ago? Yeah, past, couple, past few years, yeah. I, I don't know the exact date. Maybe I they, didn't do that. There, there, well, there, you know, there was just simply a point where I felt I graduated from Swans, and I felt I just didn't need to, I just didn't need well, uh, to do more Let's Swans go back, let's go back, though. Like, did you, you, know, and so, did you, did you, like, what was, were those records difficult to make, the early ones? Were they, you know, like, I, I, I yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they were very difficult. Um, <laughs> poker face. <laughs> um, but but it, it's actually interesting to note that there was a, a record after I graduated from Swan that he came and worked with um, Jason Lafarge, who is the, the other engineer that shares my space now with me. Um, okay. He does. He, he when he works at C, he, when he works. I almost said CBGBs. When he works at BC Studio, he calls it Caesar's Palace, but it's still the same walls and the same place. <laughs> his own gear. Um, so Laz was. I'm sorry. So Gerard didn't. Did, basically, we both knew. It was unspoken, but we both knew it was kind of over between me and Gerard to work together. But he still loved working in the space, right? Because he knew he had, he had all kinds of weird ideas of like corners that might sound good for certain things. So um, he, he came and recorded with Jason. So there was, it was like, okay. I climbed the rope up to my father. Yeah, that record, right? I guess that's four years ago or something, yeah. or five. So that was recorded here in BC Studio, but, but not by me, it was Jason. But I got to hear it. In fact, I got to feel it. It was just shaking the building. Oh, um, my God, yeah. I mean, but I, so I guess the... Uh, to me, to me those, those, especially these later Swans records, the reunion records, are, uh, I mean, I know you... But, like, they're the, the only band that's gotten back together and made a record that actually was age-appropriate for them. You know what I mean? Like, it sounds like what a Swans record yeah. should sound like for a bunch of 60-year-old guys. And it's it, it's yeah. still exhilarating. It's still exciting. It's still fucking miserable. You know, it's like it's 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 interesting. So so you and you and Michael Jira had like you just kind of like you graduated from it. Do you have any other artists that you worked with a bunch that you felt that way or like what's what's the what I know this is going to be a, an impossible question to answer, but what's the what was the best experience you had? What was like in the studio, working with somebody who's just like incredibly talented, you know, and just blew you away. And you were like, I can't believe I'm doing this. This is fucking awesome. Huh. Um, I think, I think that, that that also takes time. So whatever the answer is going to be, which I'm, I'm thinking, thinking about it, it's going to, that did like four or five records with me. And uh, what I, what I keep finding is, it's funny, I find this with a lot of bands that they um, they do a bunch of records with me and sometimes it happens, they just do a record without me. And sometimes it weirdly enough feels like unspoken stuff kind of takes a step back. And uh, because you, they, we we don't necessarily know, that happened with Cop Shoot Cop, right? They're, I think their final record they didn't do with me. And there's a few details about that Cop Shoot, the fi I guess it's called Release. There's a few details of that that sound like, oh, I thought we, figured that out like I thought that's not that this certain something isn't how that's supposed to sound right like I thought we you know built that and then now that, that thing isn't there because whoever the new person was just didn't didn't add it up or something um so I think um I mean in some ways I gotta say that that Jarrah really was I mean a lot of these people the Jarrah um I would actually say live skull I think really what it takes is to keep someone that keeps working with me and Steve keeps coming back despite mistakes, despite disagreements and despite stuff. And then we kind of work on it and, you know, not someone that's looking for the perfect person, you know, to work with. Um, I think with, with just 
with the, just a quick side note on Swans is the first one I worked with was weirdly enough a Bill Laswell production. Laswell brought Swans here, which was uh, the Burning World, and oh, yeah. on that one I was really the I was really the engineer, and I think that a trust developed between me and Michael, between me and Gerard, because it didn't go so well with 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 Laswell. Like Laswell started not really feeling the record quite so much during it, and and Gerard felt really. Uh, frustrated and unheard and somehow he, I feel like an ally in, in his mind and maybe he saw that I could actually be quite diplomatic and very much like I I really have to see both sides of <laughs> of this discussion you know right. so I, I and then that established something and I think we uh, we uh, grew with swans there was a lot of things that he felt was mistakes. If he thinks that we swamped, I, I actually don't don't agree, but he felt that we swamped all those early records with too much reverb and too much processing, all at his behest. But then he felt that we did that. But then it was like when he came back with that side project, Angels of Light, and he was like, no more reverb. Uh, then we're fine. So it was even despite mistakes. In the band Live Skull, for instance, uh, they kept it was weird because there was a lot of reviews that did that people were criticizing the sounds of the records. And I was like feeling bad, and I was like, "Do we need to talk about this?" Everyone's saying they're mur muddy, you know, and they're murky. And yeah. then, and then Tom Payne from Life Skull said to me, "You know, we're a murky and muddy band." <laughs> there you go. And I was like, "There you go. You're catching the vibe, man." You oh, know, like that's what your studio okay, and you—that's so... what you and your studio were all about, though. Like for me personally, and 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 the records that I listened to, like that. I I I mean, even though Yes is my favorite band of all time, I there is a darkness to yes. And like uh, so many of the records that, that you, and it's pro probably because of a classical influence, but the, the uh, so many of the records that you did before I went in to work with you were very, very dark, heavy records, like not heavy in like a metal way, but like just heavy, just like you, you could just feel the weight of a cop shoot cop record. You know what I mean? Like you could feel it. It's like, it's a fucking visceral thing. And like your records are very much like that. And I know for every artist has its own way of doing things. So of course it depends on the artist of who you're working with or how it's going to sound. Yeah. But you know, and, and then of course you just have to work with that as you can, but you know, it, it's interesting. I, I, and as a, I want to segue, you brought up live skull. I want to segue into um, your 35th anniversary record that you put out the BC 35. Um, uh, talk a yeah. little bit about that. And then I want to talk about your, records as well we got a, we got a couple minutes left but I, you've had a long solo career um and uh actually fucking really good and people should totally check it out it's like you know you're not you're more known as a producer and engineer but like <laughs> but you you're right um let's talk about the bc35 record and how that all came about and how you uh got all everybody involved and whatnot Actually, there's a pretty intense story behind that. By the way, as far as the, the heavy mud or the murk of the record, of the record it, it might actually be that I listened to a lot of classical music under duress by my parents when I was growing up. I mean, literally going to the Philharmonic in huge orchestral spaces, you know, tw twice a week. Operas on Monday and Philharmonic on Thursdays. Yeah. And I was not a happy, I was not a happy camper, I got to tell you. But I, um, I heard that. You know, so I really got to hear these like massive spaces and stuff. So that might have, I've, I have wondered because it was part of my formation of my brain. So maybe that influenced stuff. Um, no, also, sure. the amount of the com the complexity of the sound, and also just the, the fact that I wasn't trained as in orthodox engineering. Um, I started engineering at a time when everything was very separated, and you, you know, even stuff I liked. I always keep coming back to like Jeff Beck as an example of a bit of an artist that I liked but couldn't stand the sounds of the records because they were they were very like if you could hear the hi hat like fucking intimately and stuff like that. And I was like, I don't I, do I care? Uh, no offense to drummers, but I was like, I just didn't get it right. So and sonically, I was just not thinking anything. I, I, that's the thing is I wasn't very sonic because I thought I didn't really actually think things sounded that great records in general i thought there was some great live experiences but when i would see, hear records i, I it's not like the records themselves sounded that great to me so i wasn't following that path i followed my own path luckily and dumbly and uh, i always felt like i wanted it to feel like just 
like a surreal live experience. Like, like what I felt at some of the live shows, however we figured it out to have it come through two little speakers at conversation volume. Yeah, kind of I mean, Martin, that. Martin, you just, you just explained your whole fucking career. I mean, and that's, that's the thing. That's the thing that you brought to so many of these bands. You like, like your space, your I intuition with doing that is what brought that live feel. It like, it's like, you know, when I listen to Auto Manipulation, the Modern Matter record, it feels like it's 1995 and I'm in the room with the guys, you know, and those yeah. drums are beating me up and the bass is beating me up and it's fucking George is in my face screaming at me, you know, it's fucking, it's awesome. And like so many of your records are like that. Um, you know, I, I, I like, I, that's why like when, when I, we finally reconnected when you, you, you approached us about doing this BC 35 thing and, and recording it and whatnot at Vitus, it was really exciting to me. And, you know, like, uh, I, I want to, before we run out of time, I want to just throw a few plugs in for you. There's a documentary called Sound and Chaos um, yep. that that uh, you can go to Martin's website and find the uh, link to it. Uh, and um, there's also the BC35 album, which was uh, uh, 50 musicians on it, something like that. Is yeah, that a little a little over 50 participants. I mean, it's it's just like, that's a yeah. massive endeavor. And uh, it, it's, it was an honor to have you do that. You, you've played a couple of times now and to have Live Skull reunite and play, which was fucking super cool. Um, yeah, I, I like, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> well, sorry. I'm, I'm well, gushing. I mean, well, well, basically there was, basically what happened, I'll try to make this super simple, but, but I got assaulted outside the recording studio um, in right. um, two, 2015. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was bad. I had two, two bottom teeth knocked out, um, you know, and for some reason, the, the person that, that plays drums with me in, in Europe, because when I tour over there, I use a drummer who's a pal of mine in Berlin, who was originally from Brooklyn. And uh, he's biracial. And he'd been assaulted in Berlin over that, like by basically some neo-Nazis or something. So for some reason, right at that time, he and he's very empathetic, and he kind of flipped out about my assault. Somehow, and he was like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" He goes, "Cause and also I didn't really the money, you know, for my my teeth and stuff like that." And he was, and there's some medical medical bills. He goes, "Oh, we gotta like do a Kickstarter. We gotta do this, and um, we gotta turn this into something positive." And then it's really funny because I said, ah, "Kickstarter? I don't know. I don't think um, I think you need to have a product. You have to you, just, you can't just say Martin needs help. You need a, a thing." And I also said, "I I don't really want to ask for money. Like I just I." There's people with bigger problems and bigger medical conditions, and I feel like an asshole, like asking for money. It ain't, I can't. If you don't want to ask for money on my behalf, you know, that might be a thing. That might, that's fine. Um, but I, I, I he got we got stuck on this thing. He was on hit Kickstarter. And I was like, you need a thing. He he calls me back the next day. He goes, I got it. Why don't we get like a ton of people and we'll go into your space, and everyone would just make a huge racket. We'll record it. It'll be a mess, but it'll still sound really impressive and. That's what we'll do. That'll be the Kickstarter. Uh, and, he, and he said, we'll call it recording of the century. And I was like, I don't know. But let me think about it. And then, then I, that night I looked at the calendar and I was like, hold on. This is 2015. If we wait till January of 81, that's 35 years since the first Brian Eno session. That, that would be 35. It would be the 35-year anniversary record. And maybe we can do something a little more, you know, figured out than just getting like, massive amount of people in a room doing what how many amplifiers would that take and it, it was <laughs> problematic so it's like we'll like split it up we'll split it up over two days and we'll get people to like make stuff or participate and a mix of improv or people could write a piece especially for 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 this so um and um that was the idea so then that slowly when it finally became and that and by the way that was just gonna be a kickstarter that was gonna be private just for dope for for donors but then it was such a massive amount of music some people improvised like with the cop shoot cop people wrote something for it the stuff where i actually played with like bob burt and al kidges and kisses and stuff we just wung it it was like just noise improv um everything was like 20 minutes in front of a in front of a limited audience in the studio um but once i started like actually doing the mixing i was and it, the mixing itself took me because it had to be arranged figured out some of the improvs had to be kind of edited and everyone knew i was going to like work with it and that took uh, uh, 
seven months to, to actually do that. Plus, it took me a month just to recover from the party, basically. <laughs> so and then I was like, "This the world has the world has to see this. The world has to see this." So it wasn't even that obvious. The world has to hear this. And then we figured it out, find the label, Bronson Recordings in Italy, and uh, then we figured. I thought, "Oh God, God, it's a double album." Everyone said, forget about a double album. So then we did two volumes spread out a, a year apart. And so, right. B, so it's BC35, like the studio, BC35. There's a volume two, BC35. And, and that's, that's what it was. And yeah, a lot of it, it's funny because I got into this, right around that time, I got into this thing just for shits where I would maybe open up or for a band or thing. Actually, it's funny, it, it, occur, it first occurred to me at the, the, at the, premiere of the documentary where I was like, why don't we do, and we ended up doing it at like Bowery Electric upstairs at Bowery Electric, which is like three blocks from where the films premiered and screened at Anthology right. Film Archives. So it premiered, and then after I said, of course, I'm like, me, I always love a party. I'm like, we gotta do an after party, right? So I was like, oh, we're gonna have all these people because they appear in the film. Why don't we just go, just, just like, whatever, just make a racket, just see what happens. And it was ridiculously, uh, successful in that like you know you suddenly had two 200 people just f fucking walking over to bowery electric filling that little space upstairs and we had a bunch of little like amps and every and then that sort of became popular like people asked me to do i was gonna be it was gonna be a one-off people asked me to do it again and i was like, i don't know so but basically what happened is slowly from that instant through the beginning of bc35 this sort of thing started happening where i would get people to that aren't normally improvisers that are rock people to do like a short, noisy um, improvisation with like a good drummer, basically, and uh, hold, kind of holding something down. And it would, <laughs> so it would not be, it would not be a John Zornest improv. It would not be a jazz improv. It would not be a free jazz improv. And it would not be a 60s style psych improv or a blues improv. It would be, I guess, like a noise rock improv, unscripted. And those started, and basically getting people that are like, "Huh, improvise me? What? Like, oh yeah, don't do I mean, that, that's I mean, that's we that's the it. that's the best part about it is you like the only way to create something new is to is to make people do something they've never done before, and you know, it's like that's that's what you were doing. It's like I I, I wouldn't be comfortable doing improv, although I improv on stage all the time, but I do it in my own context, and so you know, like doing it with people you've never been on stage with before is really testing yourself and how you're how you're able to adapt you know and you and the musicianship behind it all it's a it's a great concept and i'm so glad that it sort of morphed in its own natural way it's it's such a great thing it's amazing yeah it just slowly it was like a fluke and then and then by public demand i thought it would just be a one-off it started coming back like someone would ask me actually the band um Parlor Walls had their record release. I think they were called Eula then. And then the, the woman from Parlor Walls asked me, would you do that again? I'm like, huh? And then I was surprised. I like sheepishly went to Bob Burton, and Al Kizzes and said, you know that crazy thing we did in like a little, you know, that little space? Would you do it again? And my, my pitch was, we'll actually sort of maybe do a line check and stage. Right. And I was, I was like, like, thought I would be asking something that they would really do that again. We're not improvisers. And they all were like, sounds great. And they said, yes. And I was, because I think the magic word is, the magic word there's 20 minutes is all that stuff. Cause I just, <laughs> that's not a, that's not, but that, that made it possible because it, I think 45 or an hour, all that kind of like yeah. improv head kind of thing. I think this has got to be a fast and dirty and, and hopefully beautiful. And, and, well, and it's I, I mean, and, it's funny. Uh, it's funny. You say, it's funny. You say 20 minutes because what is 20 minutes? It's the side of a vinyl record on a you know classic prog song close to the edge or rush's hemisphere uh uh yeah like like any of the sort of amazing side you know genesis uh i'm trying to think but, but yeah like and, and any sort of like uh gates of delirium what are they're all 20 minutes they're all 20 minutes the great prog yeah. long forms are 20 minutes what whatever Technical engineers and designers came up with what an album should be. We actually didn't pull 20 minutes out of a hat. You know, a, a, a good side to get good quality, just the way it's set up and the size of a, of, a, of a disc, of a lacquer. You know, it's like 16, 20 minutes is like 
kind of max for quality, you know, 19. And that's, um, and, and, and the whole album, the whole album being a whole album typically being 36 like 38 minutes, 40 minutes. Yeah. It's funny. That's, 38 is pushing it. That's what the, Beatles, the Beatles, was, thir- the Beatles being... was 36. The Beatles was 36. Ah, okay. It was like, that but, was like the limit. But that's yeah. what we normally, that's what we, excuse me. It's, it's no, it's no coincidence that that's what we think of as being like a decent, right. you know, I mean, we, we can all stand for some bands to play for an hour, but the average band, you know, 36 minutes, 40 minutes. Thank you very much. That's a, that's yep. a decent length. We got it. Um, so the 20 minutes <laughs> is funny. Yeah, it's not, not a, not a coincidence, but yeah, then I started, I, I started in court and then my, my album, my new album solstice. Um, there's some of that, that, you know, we, I would, because what's funny is every, there's jamming everywhere. Like even when you come up with a, an idea for a band by yourself, because I ask people, how do you, how did you write? I, also, I like information when I record a band. I was like, I like to hear everything. What's behind it? What are the words? Just whatever. How did, how long did it take to make? What was the process of making it? Even if it doesn't seem like that's going to affect where I put the microphone, I still like processing that information. It, who knows? So I asked them, how do you guys write this? And even when people say, I don't know, and then I gave, it to the band it's all improvisation it's all like there's always stream of consciousness it's just whether people are exposed and watch the stream of consciousness unfold or whether right. it gets cleaned up and organized at some point so then it's put aside and okay we we won't we won't say anything about what the proto demo sounded like that's just gone with history and um so with then i started being a little more bold and then you hear that on a few songs in solstice in fact the the song that seems like I guess the more powerful one, Let It Fall, was kind of born of like just grooves and jams. And it was really funny. There's, on the, there's a couple of the improvised spots on that record where the key, because I, I went back and I listened to the later, I listened to what we recorded. Um, and I was like, oh my God, I guess this is, this is a disaster. I guess it's just bad. And then the key was, take me out of the mix. That was the key. So take Martin out. Take, and, and all that was left was what like Genevieve, Fernworthy, she was playing viola, and then, and then the rhythm section, and they were, I think they were vibing, and they just had me as like, who knows what, and then I, I was also messing with effects at the time, like my guitar through effects, that was good, but the, but whatever thought I had of what, of what this, how this might be a song, that was all bad, so then that, that was sort of redone, <laughs> but I, I kept the spirit I kept the spirit basically of a rhythm section and these musicians just kind of going for it and on the spot, like listening to each other and, and no, that's awesome ideas. And then I kind of, so, so it was a sort of a writing process, but a little inside out, not the traditional way of doing it. It's killer. All right. So uh, we're going to wrap it up. I want to, I have a couple of things to say, uh, go get solstice or listen to it uh, wherever you can listen to it by Martin BC, uh, the Martin BC band. Um, Check out Sound and Chaos, which is a documentary about BC Studios. Um, thank you so much for being on this. I want to blame you for the reason I drink coffee now. Because uh, when I was, what, I was 20 when I recorded with you, and I'd never drank coffee before. And you would go through about five pots a day. And I started drinking coffee because of you. So, you know, now I'm uh, totally addicted. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I was like, no, no click track, but you got to drink coffee. Your coffee. <laughs> so everything's really fast. Um, anyway, thank you so much for doing this. I, we'll do a part two at some point because you just have so many great stories and I like really enjoyed this. I miss you. And I think that you're one of the greats. And uh, thank you so much for doing this, man. We'll see you miss, soon. Miss you too. And I miss, and I miss, I miss the bar. I miss St. Vitus. Yeah, man, it's coming back. Don't worry about it. It's going to be a while, but it's coming back. Watching. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Martin. Cheers, buddy. Bye. Good night, everyone.